I'm senior biotech analyst, John Vandermosten, and today we'll be speaking with ElectroCore's chief medical officer, Dr. Peter Statz, who has spent more than 25 years focused on pain management. He's developed and implemented minimally invasive procedures for neuromodulation and addressing chronic pain. He's also the president of the World Institute of Pain, among other leadership positions. ElectroCore is a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation or NVNS company and has only scratched the surface of what's possible in the space. Vagus nerve stimulation goes back to the 1880s where New York neurologist James Corning hypothesized the approach would help patients with seizures. Since then, other researchers have found new promising indications. Dr. Stats, how did you get started in the field of vagus nerve stimulation? Well, first of all, thanks, John. Thanks for the invitation to be here with you. It's kind of an exciting time and it's exciting for me to talk about this whole uh, area. I, you know, my background came, as you mentioned, I was the founder of the Division of Pain Medicine at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And I started doing neuromodulation strategies for my patients with chronic pain and movement disorders very early on. I was one of the first academic anesthesiologists out there. Uh, I've been president of what's called the North American Neuromodulation Society, the main society that looks at um, how electricity interfaces with the nervous system. And then my son uh, was um, born with uh, peanut allergies. And I was trying to figure out a way how to marry my interest in trying to use minimally invasive procedures, neuromodulation, and then my intrinsic interest in trying to figure out the best way of saving my son's uh, life, so to speak. Um, fortunately, he's never had a real problem, but it was became an academic pursuit where we started studying drugs and then neuromodulation therapies to block airway reactivity and anaphylaxis. We went and did some work up at Columbia University with a former um, uh, attending of mine when I was a resident, uh, looking at stimulating the vagus nerve in an animal model to block airway reactivity. And we figured out how to do it using the vagus nerve. And we didn't know exactly where we were going to get and how we were going to get there initially. But this was an area of really you know, great interest of mine. Um, we figured out how to do this percutaneously, developed a technique of sticking an electrode into the skin. So if someone's in the emergency room, they could potentially get treatment very quickly. And then our scientists figured out how to do this non-invasively. And we were studying patients with asthma and airway reactivity with really kind of interesting and promising results showing that we could improve airway reactivity with this non-invasive approach. And the first patients said, my headaches went away. So we went down this pathway of developing a non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator that's now used you know, somewhat broadly in the Veterans Administration, Department of Defense um, for primary headache disorders episodic cluster headache, prevention of cluster, acute treatment of migraine, prevention of migraine. More recently, we also have adolescent migraine. And then also we have um, hemicranium continuum and paroxysmal hemicranium. So we're fitting a real important need where there's really not a great, great therapeutic option for a lot of these patients. Um, yeah, yeah, course, that's exciting. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting yeah, um, so thing we got started. So, so gamma core is actually not the first uh, device approved for vag vagus nerve stimulation. I, I think uh, about 20, 25 years ago or so, uh, there was an approval for um, uh, epilepsy and it was actually implanted, I believe. Can you, how did that work out and, and any, any, any items of note on that? Well, sure. So I, it really was a great step forward for our understanding of the interface of electricity with the body and the nervous system. In 1997, a company called Cyberonics, now Livanova, um, developed the first and got the first FDA clearance for the use of an implanted vagus nerve stimulation for epilepsy. Now, as you think about it, it's actually kind of a, you know, a relatively major surgery to cut down around the vagus nerve, put a coil electrode around the vagus nerve, connect that to on a wire that connects to a power source that's typically implanted in the chest, and so when you think about that, while it works really quite well, and I'm you know, proud that they're moving ahead and making great progress, it relegates the patients who can get that to uh, the very end of the road. In fact, many of the patients have already had a section of their brain removed before they became eligible for an implanted vagus nerve stimulator. But the body is an electrochemical organ. 
it doesn't only respond to drugs, it responds to electricity as well. So there's an important lesson to be learned from that. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 fascinating. And you know, I, I think maybe some of the listeners are wondering what exactly the vagus nerve is. Can you describe a little bit about it? And I think you know we're going to throw up a slide or, or an image that'll that'll show it while you're describing it. But please let us let us know a little bit more about that. Sure, I, I think the vagus nerve is one of the most um, maybe the Rodney Dangerfield of the nervous system. It's the underappreciated nerve or it gets no respect, but it's incredibly incredibly powerful. The vagus nerve was named after the vagabond or the wanderer. And it's one of the cranial nerves that I think of as the, the physical structure that is the mind-body interface. It's how the brain controls the visceral structures, the chest, the gut, et cetera, the spleen, inflammation. And it's how the information is made back to the brain so the brain can make thoughtful um, approaches on what to do if you're hungry to eat, et cetera. And so this is really, really an important structure. Many of us think about the spinal cord as being important, and it is, and it is, or the brain is being important as it is, but this one is also really important. And fortunately, we've figured out how to tap into it to access this nerve. Yeah, yeah, exciting stuff. And um, so, and then what is non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation? You talked about, you know, the implantable, um, but we can also do it without, without, you know, cutting or surgery or anything like that uh, with gamma core. Can you explain what that is? And then also how gamma core fits into, into the picture? Sure. So I, I look at, you know, basically kind of very simplistically, there's two different approaches for accessing the vagus nerve. You can do surgery, cut down and do an implant on the vagus nerve or what our, um, our uh, you know, advancement in science is, we figured out how to stimulate the vagus nerve without having to do surgery, without having to place a needle in somebody, without having to place a percutaneous electrode. We do this with a non-invasive approach, taking a small device the size of a small cell phone and can access the same nerve and stimulate the nerve without causing pain uh, and getting the benefits of stimulating the vagus nerve. So it's taken the surgery out of surgeons and put it into the hands, out of the hands, out of the surgeon and into the hands of the patient. Yeah, and I think one of the benefits that, uh, that you get from having a non-invasive approach is you can do a lot more studies to see how it works. Because if you're going to actually implant something that's a little bit more serious and it probably creates a huge barrier for, uh, for conducting some studies. And, and that kind of leads me to the next thing I wanted to talk about uh, is our three areas where uh, there's promise shown for uh, NVNS. Um, including Parkinson's disease, PTSD, and opioid use disorder. Now, I want to state to everyone that these are not approved, um, not approved indications for gamma core, uh, but research has been done so far, or actually in progress, is, is suggested that it might be. So I wanted to kick it off with Parkinson's disease, uh, and that affects about a million people uh, in the United States and about 10 million people around the world. It's usually affecting older people, but about 4% uh, are for people below 50. It's a well-studied area, so we know a lot about it, but as with many other neuro neurodegenerative diseases, there's no disease-modifying therapy that's been approved for it. Um, and so one of the interventions that's being investigated is NVNS for Parkinson's disease. So, so gamma core was actually the subject of a recent study exploring NVNS and Parkinson's, and I think you were involved with it, and I know, I know Electric Core was involved with it. Uh, what did that study find, and can you give us some background there on that? Well, yeah, so this is really interesting. And, and as you point out, this is an area of unmet medical need. Um, we have drugs and we jump from there to st stimulating a structure in the brain with an invasive approach. And there's a need for something in between those two areas of what can we do. This study was done by a group of investigators which actually looked in a randomized sham controlled fashion at a month of vagus nerve stimulation versus a month of sham controlled stimulation in a crossover design. So both patients saw both and one could compare the outcomes of a sham or a placebo with the active therapy on a variety of metrics. Some of the interesting things that they found was that number one, you could improve the stance time of somebody who's got Parkinson's disease. Number two, the, the ability to ambulate was improved as well. 
areas that are really interesting to me as a neuroscientist of sorts, uh, a poor man's neuroscientist, although I, my undergraduate degrees were in, in what we now call neuroscience, um, but is changes in brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. They measured TNF alpha. Now that is an inflammatory cytokine uh, and what we're going to learn about over time, when you have me back some other time, John, is that the inflammation is really important in a variety of diseases. And this one was we looked at, could we modulate TNF alpha, or what the, the investigators looked at, TNF alpha, glutathione, which is kind of thought of as a scavenger of inflammation, and BDNF, <laughs> brain-derived nerve growth factor. And TNF alpha went way down, glutathione went way up, and BDNF went way up in the group that was shown to receive the, the vagus, the active non-invasive vagus nerve stimulator. So again, this was a relatively small study, not enough to go to the FDA with yet, but really promising for patients out there who um, uh, are suffering with uh, Parkinson's disease and need another strategy. I, I do wanna underscore that this is not FDA approved yet, but it's part of my job as a scientist to come up with the next strategy for, for patients and the next needs for patients. And I think this is one of them. Um, you know, some of the biochemical readings that you mentioned, do those, do those changes suggest that maybe longer term, because I think you said it was only a month when, they, when it was applied. Does that suggest that perhaps longer term uh, application of MBNS might have a, a greater effect? Well, I, that's what I, I think, you know, if you take a look at the, what Parkinson's is, is a neurodegenerative disorder. And if we're able to modulate the brain chemistry in the way that these investigators have suggested and carry that out for a longer period of time, it looks really, really promising. I have to underscore again, we need to do those studies, but uh, if I'm looking and I'm placing bets on the future, this is an area that I think is extraordinarily promising and underserved. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the thoughts about Parkinson's disease patients is that when you were describing how the device is used, you know, you hold it up to your neck, might, there, might they have a, a problem with that, you know, because of lack of motor control? Um, is, that, is that something that can be easily overcome? Well, yeah, look, we're, we're already off to the races with um, a next generation device that will be applicable for areas where a patient may not be able to hold a device. If you need an acute device for a critical care indication or in an indication such as this, we have <clears throat> ideas and sketches on exactly how this is gonna uh, play out. Okay, yeah, that's exciting. I, I assume it would be somehow connected to your, your neck or something. And I can't tell you, you can't say. I can't tell you, it's all the big secrets still. <laughs> you tell me, but you'd have to kill me. Okay, I understand, all right. Um, so, you know, the next, the next area I wanna talk about, because we wanna talk about three different areas where there's a lot of promise. And actually there are more than just three, um, but PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. That, that term has been around quite a while. I think it first started picking up in the 1980s. And then we started hearing a lot more about it in the 2000s after service members came back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And actually, I think now uh, we're seeing that it's actually even broader than that, broader than just you know, military conflict-related PTSD. Um, Dr. Stutz, what is the prevalence of PTSD and what's currently being done to address it? Yeah, so PTSD is, stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and it's got slightly different names, and sometimes people would want to take off the D to um, make it so people aren't feeling like we're attacking them in some way of the disorder, but post-traumatic stress. And it's incredibly common. Back in the Vietnam era, it was estimated that up to 30% of people coming back from Vietnam were having some evidence of post-traumatic stress disorder. In the United States today, across the board, it's closer to 3.6% more prevalent in women than in men. Hmm. Um, and with our, our um, uh, lifetime, um, our, our Gulf War vets are closer to 10%. I'm incredibly passionate about trying to help our veterans. And per se, I spent part of my time helping the Wounded Warrior Project to try to come up with novel strategies and help care of our, our soldiers with PTS. This is a real, real problem that I think is, um, underserved and we have a large unmet medical need to try to help these, our veterans. And it, frankly, it's something that every American should be feeling we should be investing in and trying to help. Definitely, definitely. And what kind of research has been done for NVNS and PTSD so far? And what, what has it found? What are the preliminary findings? 
So um, PTS has been, you know, it's been challenged for people to come up with strategies. And you've heard of things such as intensive cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think the Wounded Warrior Project does a wonderful job with some intensive therapy for people who are, are really at the end of the spectrum. There's another whole field taking a look at what's called a stellate ganglion block, putting a, a needle into the neck and, stim mm -hmm. and blocking a set of autonomic nervous system, not the vagus, but the opposite one, the, the, the sympathetic nervous system. There is groups looking at drugs like LSD and, and ketamine and mushrooms as well. And then I think the fourth really very interesting area is vagus nerve stimulation. One of the preeminent researchers, um, oh, there's actually several, uh, Emmanuel Lehrman in UC San Diego and uh, Doug uh, Bremner at Emory VA mm -hmm. are both doing really groundbreaking research on mechanistically how vagus nerve stimulation, specifically non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation, our gamma core device, can potentially help these veterans. And they've looked at things like blood flow to the brain, uh, modulation of another inflammatory cytokine called IL-6 and showing that in, in stressful situations, the inflammation typically goes up in someone who's got PTSD, but we can block that from happening with vagus nerve stimulation. And then of course, looking at outcome and, and um, a psychological improvement in patients who have PTS as well is all part and parcel of, of the next step of therapies. Again, a huge unmet medical need. And we've now, deployed vagus nerve stimulations in literally tens of thousands of patients. So we know that it's pretty safe. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that part is, I think, pretty well established. Now we have to really demonstrate long-term efficacy, much like we did with the, we, we talked about with the Parkinson's world, we need to do the same kind of long-term efficacy uh, with the PTS uh, patients as well to show that we can maintain these benefits that Dr. Lerman and, and, and Dr. Bremner are showing. Yeah, yeah, and so so gamma core actually has been used in some of these um, investigations as well. Uh, yeah. Any 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 further comments on on what the studies have shown so far? Well, really, changes in blood chemistry, changes okay. in blood flow in the brain. So, what they one of the things that uh, Dr. Bremner showed, for example, is that you have a hyperacute state in patients with PTS uh, patients, or increase in blood flow to areas of the brain. And with advanced mm -hmm. imaging studies shows that you can normalize that with mm -hmm. vagus nerve stimulation. So it's really um, fascinating to me as a scientist and, and trying to tease out anything that someone could say, oh, that's just a placebo effect. We're showing these brain chemistry changes across disorders, as well as neuroimaging studies across disorders to show and validate the rationale for why we're doing this. You know, I, I just have a question that that just just came into my head right now. Uh, are the are the you know is the chemistry different between diseases? I mean, you're applying the same thing, right? The same the same uh, electrical field, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the same intensity, I assume. Yeah. Do, I, I mean, is it changing what what what's what what the chemical changes are in the mind and the brain? Well, yeah. I mean, I think part of what happens with vagus nerve stimulation, you know, look, the vagus nerve is one nerve that goes to an area of the brain and branches out dramatically from there. Mm -hmm. This, um, um, what we do is we don't treat a hundred diseases, mm -hmm. we treat a few neurotransmitters and a few cytokines particularly well. And those yeah. few neurotransmitters then go off and do different things. So for example, one of the studies that was done at the end by one of the doctors who's now at the NIH looked at glutamate production in the brain mm -hmm. in an animal model of migraine. And what they showed is that glutamate's going up as the animal's starting to have behavioral responses consistent with migraine. And you can block that behavioral response and block the glutamate production. And glutamate only doesn't only work in headaches. It crosses into a number of different areas. In fact, it's the most uh, prominent excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. Um, inflammation, C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, IL-6, these are, these are modulators of inflammation. They um, affect a number of different diseases. We may not be affecting the disease directly, but we are affecting modulators of disease particularly well. It's, it sounds like it's bringing things back into balance. That's, 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 what I'm, that's the takeaway I'm getting from what you're saying. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's not very scientific, but 
Um, we have been talking about mind-body medicine for um, literally 2,000 years with the uh, ancient Asians, and they've talked about the yin and the yang. And I think about that somewhat similarly. In our world today, we are um, overrun with sympathetic overdrive. We have get up in the morning, you have your first cup of coffee, and then you're off to your first meeting, and then you don't get to go to bed and relax until midnight. And so your sympathetic overdrive is running over time. Your parasympathetics is not doing what it should be. If you think about where we were when we were cavemen, you needed that sympathetics to run away from that uh, saber-toothed tiger one time, and then it chilled back down. And world, our worlds have changed. So I think yeah. that this is trying to get things back into balance for us. And again, that is definitely not something that I would say to the FDA, but I, <laughs> I, I conceptually think about that in terms of us um, thinking about why do we work in so many diseases and why is there such an increased prevalence of so many types of diseases in our world today? Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different areas where uh, NVNS can have an impact. Um, and we're only going to talk about three today, uh, limited time. But the third one I wanted to discuss is opioid use disorder. And probably a lot of people are paying attention uh, a couple of years ago, noticed that this was the dominant uh, issue, the dominant health crisis issue faced in the United States. Back in 2019, the CDC estimated there, that there were almost 50,000 drug overdoses, uh, and that was a 4% rise over the prior year. And in 2020, it was up 30%. There are some approaches available already for opioid use dis disorder. A lot of them are drugs that you know you, you take and they, and they calm down the receptors, uh, but they're not consistently effective. So what might GammaCore be able to do to help this population? Well, first of all, um... You know, one of the top um, uh, problems people have out there is migraine, affecting 14% of the population. And patients with migraine uh, happen to receive opioids. Now, it's it's absolutely the case that um, most neurologists, specialists in this field, would not say put people on opioids for their migraines. But that's not what happens in the real world. If you go to a community ER, about 70% or just under that, 70% of the time, the doctors actually prescribe opioids. So Having, first of all, having an alternative to opioids for painful conditions like migraines and cluster and paroxysmal hemicranium and some of the other things that are coming down the pike, having an alternative is incredibly important. But there's a second aspect of this that I think needs further exploration, which is can we modify um, the experience of addiction, true addiction, which is taking pills and whatnot for other than pain relief, in spite of known harm, it's part of the definition there. And how do we block and break into that cycle? And from a scientific perspective, we believe that vagus nerve stimulation can help with the extinction, that's a fancy psychological term, of bad behaviors of opio opioid misuse um, and um, getting to nor normal adaptive behaviors. So that's one aspect. Second is there seems to be sympathetic overdrive when people go through withdrawal. And there has actually been studies out there on non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation to block the symptoms of withdrawal called the COWS, which is an opioid withdrawal symptom scale. To, to, can we block those, those symptoms? And the answer is yes, we can um, with non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. The one that got approved by the FDA was the bridge device, which goes to a little branch of the vagus nerve on the ear. And so I think when we are exploring, can we get it with 100% of the vagal fibers in the neck? I think that looks very, very promising. Okay. And it, you know, how does this replace some of the pharmacological solutions that are out there? I mean, there's a lot of approved drugs. I mean, I think sublocade, um, buprenorphine, things like that. Is, is, it, is it something that could replace those? Well, the answer in, in, the, in the short answer is yes or the long answer is yes, and the short answer is no. The short answer is we need to have as many tools in our toolbox to help our patients with have opioid use disorder to get over this and mm -hmm. move on to the next step. The, the therapies that you've described are mixed opioid agonist antagonists. So they, they keep people from wanting to take more pills, but they're still taking a pill every day. And they're still having the side effects of, of various <laughs> drugs. So from, from a... Um, uh, uh, a um, long-term perspective, we need more tools in our toolbox. I think this will help um, doctors 
once we get through the FDA and go through the whole process, I think down the road, we'll get to the point where doctors can use this as an adjunct to psychological mm -hmm. care, appropriate other strategies. And they do very different things. You know, one is it modulates the opioid receptor and the other modulates brain function to establish new circuits and new pathways, reverse the plasticity and modulate the sympathetic overdrive. So right now, the best information is we're gonna need both. Yeah, well, it's always good to have another tool in the toolbox. Um, so last year, GammaCore was selected for NIDA grant. I think it was in December. Um, and that was to explore effectiveness in OUD. And I think it was being conducted at Emory by one of the physicians that you mentioned earlier. Um, what, what's the progress been on that so far? It's been almost a year. What, any, any updates on that study? Um, I think they're about halfway done with their study. And okay. um, um, I don't think they've released it publicly, so I don't want to steal their thunder, but I think they have, uh, they're making good progress on their study. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye out for that. Well, we, I think we covered the three areas we, we targeted today, and thank you for sharing your expertise with us on uh, uh, non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation, Dr. Sass. We appreciate it. We didn't get a talk, um, chance to talk about all of the different things Electricore is doing, uh, but we did get to take a look at some of the future possibilities in Parkinson's, PTSD, and opioid use disorder that can help in those areas. And with that, let's close out our discussion. If you're interested in reading more about Electricore, please see our research at scr.zax.com and it's under ticker symbol ECOR. Thank you very much. Thanks, John.